Okay, everybody can hear it. Okay. Okay, so let's start. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today we are going to present uh, Meerkat parsers, our general parser library, uh, library uh, combinator library that Anastasia and I have been developing during the last year. And she will come. Better now? Okay. And she will come during uh, the second part of the talk and uh, present the rest. We are both PhD students at CWI, and CWI is the Research Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science here in Amsterdam. Just to give you an idea where is CWI, so now we are sitting in the center near the Dam School, and CWI is in the eastern part of the city. Okay, so let's start. So at some point during your development career, or anything, you need to build a parser, and usually the process starts by having a semantic model of the uh, language that you want to build. For example, in this example, you will see that we have an expression grammar, an algebraic data type, and there is trait E that represents expression and a couple of constructors for different operations that we have. Okay, so for building a parser, or the job of the parser is to turn uh, text like that, to group it like that based on the uh, arithmetic rules, and then gives you the terms back so that you can pretty print it or use some interpret it over something like that. So the problem starts, okay, how do you specify your syntax that you can go from this text to these terms? Traditionally, uh, we've been using parser generators. On the left-hand side, you will see a notation, an EBNF-like notation that has been used, for example, in Antler and YAC and many other parser generators. So you write your grammar, and then the parser generator generates a working parser. In the functional world, uh, we, it's common with Haskell, Haskell, Parsec library, and now Scala Parser Combinator, it's common that you encode your grammar directly as, uh, as a, a combinators with higher order functions. For example, here, the tilde represents the sequence combinator and the vertical bar is the alternative combinator. And languages like Scala, they are friendly to embed uh, internal DSLs, and you can write your combinators in a way that it resembles a uh, grammar. And this is nice in the sense that you don't need to get another, um, another formalism. Everything is just direct in Scala. But realizing such a natural grammar in a, in a combinator size setting is not trivial. So before that, before we start to show okay, how we get or how we can write such a grammar, I want to start with a metaphor. So parsing is essentially a search problem, and this will help us to later understand some of the trade-offs that we have. Uh, essentially, at each step, so imagine yourself standing in a maze. At each step, you can make some choices. And this corresponds to this non-determinism in parsing. Essentially, you can either go to left, to right, and at some point you hit the wall, and you have to go back, choose another point. And there is another concept in some maze. There may be some loop that if you go there, you're doomed essentially always to stay. You know, this corresponds to the problem of left recursion in parsing. So let's first start with left recursion. Left recursion is problematic in top-down parsing. Why? Because if you just directly encode your uh, grammar uh, in a programming language like Scala, what happens is that in a left recursive rule, the first call in a function is essentially the calling the function itself with the, self, uh, with the same argument, and it will never terminate. So this is a problem. And why do we need left recursion? Left recursion is essential if you want to get natural expression grammars, and which are left uh, recursive. If you want to have any sort of left associative uh, operator or left associative uh, tree, you need left recursion. So imagine you want to have such expression grammar where a star has a greater presence than plus. In YAC, for example, you can directly encode such a, uh, a specification and get a working parser. 
Okay, if your parser generator doesn't support declarative uh, operator precedence, what you can do is that you can rewrite your grammar, and this is, I think it should be f familiar to you, to, your, to those of you who have uh, taken a compiler course. This is a 10 factor grammar. Here, note that there are only essentially three uh, operators, and you got three rules, but if you have many, many operators, this may escalate very quickly. But still, you should have left recursion. If you don't have left recursion and you have to get rid of left recursion, the grammar becomes very messy. Although the whole process is automated, you can, from the grammar on the left, automatically get the grammar on the right, but the relationship between the original grammar is gone, so it means that if later you want to write an interpreter based on the terms on the grammar on this side, you have to transform things back. So, this one, really, we don't want it. I mean, there is no chance that we want this thing. This second one is okay. I mean, we may have it, but it may uh, create troubles later if you want to add one more operator later to your grammar. And this is really what we are going to achieve, and in the end of this talk, we will show you how, in Scala, you can get such a thing. Okay. So, unfortunately, left recursion, the support for left recursion in top-down parsing is very much related to the choice of backtracking scheme that you use, and because of this, we really don't have a parser community that fully supports left recursion. It's a bit tricky to get it right. So let's first start with the first backtracking scheme, which is deterministic backtracking. So here, on the left-hand side, we have a maze that each step is marked by number, so two marks at the step two, you either go to the right or go to the top, and on the right-hand side, uh, right hand, yeah, on right, left-hand side, you, you see it, uh, we have a grammar. Okay, so let's uh, see if in the first step we choose the first alternative or go right in the maze, then look at the input. The input is AC, but we've chosen AB. You match one A, but then boom, you fail. And because it's deterministic, there is no way you can go back. Okay, so if you want to use deterministic parsing, it's your job to make your grammar in a way that the parser can find its way. Otherwise, if you give such grammar to a deterministic parser, you will get a parse error. It's been very annoying, and uh, oh, okay, so the one that you have, should have chosen is the other one. So it's very annoying, and uh, since many years ago, people started adding different backtracking schemes to deterministic parsing. One of the most known ones is peg parsing, or parsing expression grammars, which is uh, a paper, I think, in 2004 or five. And this popularizes popular, uh, an older concept. So here, you have a local backtracking. In a sense, during each non-terminal, you allow to backtrack and find the exit. So let's consider the grammar. Here, A goes to BD, and B is either A or AB. Okay, let's say you want to parse B. And if you want to parse B, it's easy. The first one that we try essentially can match A in the input. Boom, we found a success, four. It's fine. But what here is important to note that this is a local success. This is not a global success. It means that later on, if we continue, if we consider the whole grammar, this success may not take us to a, uh, to a, a parse success. It may fail in the end. So here in the grammar, if you just match A, come back, you cannot see a B. But it's obvious in this grammar, if you look at the grammar, the second alternative would match it anyway. So this is the main problem with peg parsing or uh, the memoized version packet parsing. So what's happening is that if you recognize a prefix, you're done. And this may lead to some sort of uh, problem in the sense that you think this is the grammar, it may recognize, it should recognize this input, but it doesn't. And another thing that I should mention is that the concept of non-determinism and ambi ambiguity. So, so far we haven't talked about ambiguity. We just talked about non-determinism. So, non-determinism means you have multiple choices, but ambiguity means you, with these choices you can all parse the input. For example, in this example, it's expression grammar. If you have one plus two multiplied by three, you can parse it essentially in two different ways. And in order to get ambiguity, you need non-determinism because deterministic grammars at most can succeed once, but there are many grammars that are essentially non-ambiguous, but they have non-determinism. Many paths die and one path succeeds. Okay, so 
we want this uh, left recursion, we want these natural grammars, but there are these technical problems that sort of hinders us to get it. So in deterministic setting, unfortunately, it's uh, impossible to get a top-down parsing with left recursion and build combinators. With LR parsing, bottom-up approaches is possible, but uh, okay, with bottom-up parsing, you cannot have a combinator. So that we should forget. With local backtracking or peg parsing, there is a paper that describes, okay, how we can add uh, left recursion to parsing expression grammars, but unfortunately this approach produces parsers with a bias towards right, the right associative instead of left associative, and this approach has some problems. So the only way really in order to get left recursion in top-down parsing, you need full backtracking and you need to exhaust all the search space. So how does a general parser, by general parser, I mean a parser that supports full context-free grammar. How does this compare to deterministic parser? A deterministic parser like Antler, uh, the previous versions, it's like a Formula One car. It's very fast, very efficient, given that you provide the uh, racing road for it. Then it can quickly go to the end. But a general parser is more like a Jeep. It's a versatile machine. It can go to mountains, you can do experimentation with it. At the same time, if you put it in a racing road, it's still fine. I mean, it just goes, but there is overhead. So if you use a general parser, you should never expect that you can get a speed of a deterministic parser. An analogy will be like the Scala compiler versus Java compiler. The Scala compiler has, the Scala language has a much more complicated type system, type inference, and it's just simply not possible to uh, get that fast compilation, but in the end it also doesn't matter. Why? Because we get more expressivity, shorter, and more concise. More concise uh, representation of the code. Okay. But the other thing that we should note is that just general parsing is not enough. So if you just have a general parsing algorithm, it's really not enough to parse programming languages. So another analogy is from the book Parsing Techniques, which is a very interesting book. So here, uh, what uh, this picture says is that your language that you want to get essentially is this rose in the middle of the picture. And you have different means to get an approximation of this rose. And the first one is, for example, this uh, straight line, this regular expression, it gives you very rough over approximation. The second one is context free grammars, which we are using to get a very close approximation. But what you really need is the middle one, which is essentially a Turing complete machinery. But there are no efficient parsers, and you don't really want to write your parsers by hand. So what we do is that we use context-free grammars and use some other means, some uh, disambiguation filters, which we are uh, going to talk about, Anastasia is going to talk about in the second part that to help us to get these rows out. So we want to get natural grammars, and this uh, cubic bound that uh, general parser have is also not really acceptable. We want to have this near linear performance on near deterministic grammars. OK, so what are these challenges that we are going to address in order to get a natural grammar and go to a working parser? The first one is operator precedence. So any reference manual, for example, if you look Java or Scala, the operator presence is described using a table because this is the way we also learn in school. It's very natural, and there is a table usually that from top to down the precedence level goes uh, up and the left associated. But usually, what you see in the implementation is something like that. This is taken from the Java reference manual. So instead of one expression on terminal, there are 26. If you are writing a full compiler and going for full speed, then maybe it makes sense. But if you're just hacking your DSL, Writing such a thing is not uh, really feasible. And if you add one non-terminal, one operator in the middle, you have to rewrite everything else. So in the second part, we'll show you how you can use our parser library, uh, parser community library to declarative specify operator presence. The other issue is this um, two separate phases of lexing and parsing. So traditionally, parsing has been uh, divided in two phases. First, the lexer runs over the string of characters for example, in this, and then creates a stream of tokens. So a lexer essentially does uh, three things. First, it throws out white space and comments, so it has two benefits. First, it makes the uh, parsing process simpler, and second of all, you don't need to put uh, white space and layout between every two non-terminal in your rule. You just write your context-free part as if no white space or layout exists. The second one is that you are 
going to get the longest match, meaning, for example, if you look at the print line, the print line is going to be uh, uh, returned to the parser just as one ID, not as a collection of IDs like P, R separately. So the longest matched will be returned. And the, sec and the last one is that you need uh, keyboard reservation. For example, if in the beginning it's reported as an Identif as a keyboard rather than as an identifier. And in a combinator setting, we don't want that because first, this model is problematic. You usually cannot create just flow from Lexer to parser. Usually what you end up in, a, in the end is that from, because Lexer needs some parsing context, what happens is that you need to make a loop. Okay, from the parser, give the context to the Lexer, something like that. It's very difficult if you just wanna get your language in, for example, Scala working, get your parser working. So we are going to introduce this so-called scannerless parsing mode that suits, uh, suits uh, parser combinators better. Okay, the last topic I'm going to talk about is about context sensitivity. So with context-free grammars, we can get many things, but there are still many constructs in programming languages. For example, if you want to parse Python, if you want to parse data protocol, at parsing some part of the input will affect the other parts. For example, in Haskell, whenever you see some of the keywords, for example, do, then everything should be offsided regarding this keyword. So that's one determines the rest of the parsing process. In monadic parser combinators, it's very common that you essentially chain your parsers and pass values. Now we also show how in our setting, which is a general parsing, it's possible to support this sort of data dependency between parts of the parser. Okay, so this was the introduction to what and motivates our design choice. And now Anastasia will come and introduce you to the library. Thank you. So, <clears throat> hi everyone. Thanks to Ali for his introduction to parsing and uh, the problems of parsing programming languages. So, and as already mentioned, uh, our goal is to provide the parser combinator library that you can use to parse programming languages. And to achieve this, we try to combine uh, the power of general parsing with flexibility of combinator style parsing and provide the necessary disambiguation filters for this. So, and in essence, we try to combine the best of two worlds the world of uh, parser generators, and you can see the concept that I actually very well explored there. Left recursion, cubic bound, scannerless parsing, operator precedence, and the world of parser combinators known for their flexibility and extensibility. So here we should mention two important works on uh, general parsing in a top-down setting. One of them is the work by Elizabeth Scott and Adrian Johnston on GLL parsing algorithm. And they describe the solution to the left recursion and also describe how you can build the parse forest in cubic time and space. And another work by uh, Mark Johnson, which is less known and older, that uh, describes continuation passing style recognizes and how memoization in a continuation passing style can solve the problem of the left recursion. So both solutions are very different, uh, these two solutions are very different in their formulation. But we also found that there are important similarities between these two solutions. Uh, as a starting point for our library, we decided to go with the second one the solution of Mark Johnson and build parsers on top of uh, his recognizers. And the reason for this is that his solution is a functional formulation and we think that it fits the nature of parser combinators better. So, but uh, it is important to know or worse to mention that uh, we actually uh, used our experience with JLL parsing and this experience helped us to build cubic parsers on top of uh, Mark Johnson recognizers and actually other way around. So we used our experience with Mirkit library and we proposed a modification to a JLL parsing and we published a paper about this uh, called Fast to Practical JLL Parsing at uh, the conference called Compiler Construction this year. And we also submitted a publication that reports on our experience with the Mirkot Library, but it's currently under review. 
So in a generalized setting, when you try to parse an input, you can get multiple valid parse trees back. And it is very essential that there is a way to efficiently store all these trees. <clears throat> and this is usually done by constructing a parse forest instead of separate trees. So, and you can see the example of the parse forest here, and there are separate nodes that represent each tree separately, but all the common subtrees are shared. So there is the most sharing you can get. But normal uh, uh, parse forest, which is called as PPF, is not enough because we want to keep a cubic bound on parsing, and in order to achieve this, you actually need to build a binarized version of SPPF. And the essential difference between the normal SPPF and the binarized one is that there are binary intermediate nodes, so that you can keep ambiguities under the binary nodes, and that's the only way you can keep cubic bound on parsing. So, but of course, this PPF is really just a part of internal machinery of a parser, and we don't want a user to interact with this PPF in any way. Therefore, we provide a converter that takes this PPF and produces a more user-friendly representation. So here you can see uh, 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 the algebraic data type for this. And it is highly inspired by a term library, uh, which has been used successfully in ISF plus SDF uh, meta environment, so Rascal language, Spoofx language workbench. And the essential idea behind this representation is that we try to hide all the information which is essential during parsing and uh, keep all the information that may be needed for further processing. So if we take a look at the, uh, if we get the previous uh, binarized SPPF that uh, I showed on the previous slides and convert it to this representation, you can get, the, for example, here an ambiguity node and there is all the information preserved so that you can take a look at the source of ambiguity and think how you're going to resolve it. So it's much cleaner representation and this is a visualization and we also provide a visualization tool. And here it also hides some sharing that's going on behind the scenes. So now let's take a look at the basic parses that our library provides. And in essence, a parse is a function. And uh, here I use the type alias in Scala, so the real types are a bit different. But in essence, it's a function that takes three uh, arguments. Input, which is a constant during parsing then the uh, input points are pointer to the input, which is just an index, and that changes over parsing, and it's PPF lookup. So we need this PPF lo lookup to, it's a factory object, and we use it to construct this PPF. So, and uh, the continuation parsing nature of our parses is hidden behind the result type. So the parser produces the result of his PPF node, and his PPF node keeps the current position in the input, and the result type uh, uh, hides the continuation passing nature. So result type is a continuation monad, and it is in essence a function that takes a continuation and doesn't return anything. And as a monad, it comes with uh, conventional operations map and flat map to enable composition. And also there is an or else operation that defines how to combine two results, and that turns our monad into monad plus. So now let's take a look how we can use our basic parsers to define an expression grammar. And as usual, uh, to define terminals, we can directly use Scarlet uh, characters or strings or regular expressions. And here you can see example of uh, two terminals, star and plus, and you can see that just Scala characters are directly used. And we need to use a function scene here, and that's how we can define a parse, and uh, the non-terminal parse is of type non-terminal. So the scene function is important here, and there, are, there is two main responsibilities of this function. And the first one is that it takes the result of the sequence, or result of the alternation, and turns it into a memoized function, so it does memoization, and it's essential for left recursion and cubic bounds. And the second uh, responsibility is that it takes the name of the variable that holds the resulting parser 
and passes this name for his PPF construction. So, and here we need to thank Tony Sloan and his uh, DS Info library, which is based on Scala macros. And that's, this library helps us to get meta information about the name of the variable and use this meta information while constructing this PPF. So, and if we try to parse the following inputs, which is just expression that has plus and star, then uh, we get the following result, and it's again ambiguous. Uh, but you can see that all information about non-terminals, names of non-terminals, their rules, is present there. Right? So, but so far, we have a definition of the grammar that doesn't specify which derivation or which parse tree we actually want. Right? So here, at that moment, we get ambiguity, and we can just inspect it and see uh, what is missing. So now let's try to use the operator information and associativity information that we normally know from the math or we can read from the language specification uh, 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 Ali showed the table before and how we can use this information to declaratively specify or define what kind of parse tree we wanted to get. So first of all, we change the type of the parser to become an operator on terminal of type operator non terminal. And now we can extend our definition with the following combinators. The first one is a left combinator and it takes a sequence and specifies that a star and the plus operator are actually should be left associative. So that's an associativity combinator. And the second combinator, which is a different alternation combinator and its alternation greater combinator and it specifies that the star operation, operator actually of high precedence than the plus operator, which means that the plus operator can be nested under the star. So let's a little bit uncover the magic behind the operator non-terminal and it is a different function from non-terminal. It's the function that takes two integers and produces a non-terminal parser. And let me, and of course sequence and alternation are different on this type, and let me a little bit explain the basic idea behind the implementation, and here I use the pseudo notation for this, so it's not real code. So, and the basic idea is, again, we introduce two integer parameters, L and R, in this case, to our non-terminals. Then we assign a number to each alternative, which is a left or right recursive. Uh, and based on this, this is called, or we call it, a precedence level. And then based on the precedence level of each alternative, we uh, add predicates to the beginning of the alternative. And we also infer the arguments for L and R parameters that have to be passed. So, and that effectively allows us to exclude so, so certain rules from, from being predicted in a specific context. So, um, by looking at this example, you may think that having two parameters is redundant because you can observe the symmetry, right, in arguments and uh, predicates. But it's really not the case because uh, two parameters are essential so the, for the cases where both binary and unary operators are mixed and the exclusions rules are not as trivial as here. So just believe me that it is important and uh, we have currently a, a paper under review that where we describe uh, this approach uh, in more detail. So, so now if we use this uh, parser and uh, we run it, this parser uh, on the previous input, we get just one derivation and that's the one which is desired meaning that the star is nested under the plus, and that corresponds to the fact that star is of high precedence than plus. So now uh, our library also supports semantic actions, and in many cases it is very convenient uh, uh, thing to have because uh, you may uh, try to define based on the structure of your grammar immediately how you want it to build your algebraic data type, or immediately build an interpreter. So, for example, here you have an example. Uh, uh, you can see a simple calculator defined using the semantic actions in our library, and uh, we provide two combinators that can be used to attach semantic actions. 
The first one is a head combinator, and in essence, it uh, gives you access to a substring that has been parsed by a non terminal, in this case, num, and convert, can conver you can convert this substring to any value, and in this particular case, we convert it to integer. And another combinator, and combinator that attaches the semantic action that defines how the values produced by symbols in the rule can be converted to another value. So in this case, we just directly define the dynamic semantics of the plus and star, right? So we take two integers and we either multiply it or sum it. So, and you can also see uh, the type change, and in this case, the type also specifies the value that has to be produced. So one note to make here, or two notes to make, but one of them is this, uh, is that you can see that the semantic actions attached to the binary operators expect just two values, and the one attached to unary one, just one value. Although in the sequence there are three symbols in case of uh, binary operators and two symbols in case of unary operator. Why is that? Because terminals don't produce any values and they are ignored by the sequence. So therefore, the signatures expect only two or one <coughs> argument. And one, maybe the most important note to make here is that we use semantic actions not to produce values that can be used during parsing. Right, so, and given that we are in a generalized setting and there are multiple passes, right, and many of them will die eventually, so we decided to execute the semantic actions and we find that it is important, post parse. So what we do, we store semantic actions in this PPF format and as long as the parsing is done and you get your result and there are no ambiguities, you can safely run those semantic actions. The important uh, uh, implication of this is that there is no danger for the bound guarantees that we provide because there is, these values are not computed during parsing and you cannot break the bounds. So uh, now let's see how using our library can address the issues with the white space and comments and how you can actually define insignificant parts of the program. And for this, let's take a look at the sequence combinator signature. And actually, it takes an extra parameter, which is implicitly passed, and parameter called layout. And by layout, we mean white spaces and comments. And uh, the layout is just normal parser, so there is no magic behind it. And uh, this sequence combinator using, uses a more basic one that doesn't do any insertion. So what the a single tilde uh, operator does, it takes two parsers and inserts the layout in between and sequence these three with the more basic uh, uh, combinator. So and one important note here again is that uh, um, having such a design and passing the layout as an implicit parameter, you, so given that this implicit value taken from the scope, you can imagine the situation when you for example, wanted to define a different layout or redefine it for certain parts of the grammar. And in many languages, in particular in Scala, for example, if you want to parse Scala, this is maybe important because the new line changes its meaning depending in which context it is used. So now let's look at the character level disambiguation filters as we support, uh, support the scannerless parsing. And Ali mentioned that it is important because now, in certain cases, if we don't use regular expression, but we just go full scannerless mode, we need explicit longest match and explicit keyword reservation. And here we provide the combinators for this. So, for example, if you wanted to define your identifier, you have to exclude from this identifier if, as it is a keyword, and it shouldn't be recognized as a, uh, an identifier. And additionally, you have to uh, enforce the longest match. And uh, to do this, we use the another combinator, uh, which is not follow combinator. And it just says that identify cannot be followed by any character. So and this, is, this effectively uh, enforces the longest match. So now let's take a look at uh, how we can support data-dependent parsing. 
And uh, Ali mentioned uh, two use cases where this may be useful and actually useful is uh, one is uh, parsing data protocols and another one is indentation sensitive languages where you compute indentation and uh, if you wanted to do it in scannerless mode, uh, when you compute indentation and indentation defines how, uh, uh, how the groupings of, uh, of statements, for example, or delimiters. So let's look at the uh, type of the data dependent parser and uh, essential difference here and especially compared to the semantic actions is that these values are the values that produce during parsing and can be used to guide the parser. So therefore, now you can see that the type of the parser are parameterized with a type parameter and uh, the will, the, there is a possibility to produce a value with this PPF node that we always produce. So you can see the tuple, the result of a tuple that has a PPF node and any value attached to it. So, and yeah, that's how it says. So let's take a look at the example and we have chosen to uh, discuss example of IMAP protocol and here you can see uh, an input which uh, has a number in curly braces and uh, a sequence of uh, characters afterwards. And actually the number of, of characters afterwards is defined by the number provided in curly braces. So that's what I'm a protocol says, right? So if you write the definition of literal aids taken from this protocol using our basic combinators, you can see that there is no dependency on the number and the sequence of octaves. By the way, the star combinator here just directly gives you a parser that can parse arbitrary number of octaves. So what can we do? We can use our data dependent parsers. And first let's define uh, a method, octaves, that takes a number and takes a non-terminal and uh, produces a parser on the fly that has a specific number of uh, symbols sequence in a rule, right? So here we use the fold left to, to describe this uh, semantics. Now let's try to change uh, the little a's and first we apply the map, which is very similar to the head operator of uh, used for semantic actions with uh, one essential difference is that the integer value computed here from the substring it's actually inserted into the result of the parser. And this means that in some place, at some place in the sequence, we can use this number to do some things. And here we use the, we call the method. So we, we use a different sequence combinator that accept closures. And in this case, it's a closure that expects an integer number. And uh, this integer number is gonna be the one produced by the number. And it calls a method octus to generate the parser. So, and if you take a look at the signature of uh, this sequence combinator, you may notice that it resembles the flat map that is commonly defined for monadic parsers, but there is a one essential difference, is that all the sequence combinators that we provide, they have a side effect of constructing a binary intermediate node. So that's, that's always the case, and in this case, it's the closure is run, given the input, the par you run the parser, then there will be a node constructed, and it will be attached to the previous result to create an intermediate node. As, uh, that's the foundation of our, our framework to construct an SPPF. So, and uh, one maybe note uh, to make here is that, uh, well, in contrast to the semantic actions when we can still uh, keep the, bound, the cubic bound guarantees, here you are sort of on your own. But for certain cases, this flexibility is useful and doesn't affect any bounds. So we, that's a handy thing to have. So now let's go back to the start of the presentation and look at our case study, expression language. And now, again, this uh, algebraic data type that defines uh, your expression language. And now we have also a definition of the parser for this language. And now we can use this parser to, we also use the semantic actions here 
And now I can use this parser to get directly from the string to ADT that we want. So here you can notice that the left combinator that we use here is actually different from the one that I explained. And the difference is that so if we consider plus and minus operators, we all know that each of them is left associative, but they are of the same precedence. But there is another thing is that they are left associative with respect to each other. And that gives us an associativity groups, and in our library we also support associativity groups, in this case left associativity group. And we also didn't have enough time to describe, to, uh, describe uh, many uh, uh, combinators that our library supports. And in particular, associativity groups, and uh, we can have left, right associative group, and also non-SOC associative groups, non-associativity non ones, right? And uh, uh, the last one may be uh, very useful when you define the Boolean expressions. So we also didn't have enough time to uh, mention other character level filters that we also support. And we also support the BNF construct, and you have seen an example star. So we have, for example, combinators for various kind of sequences, and the ones that also can, be, can uh, specify separator. So and now let's take a look at the Java grammar. And this, this expression, expression part of the Java grammar, and this, the grammar that is written in a natural form. And you can see that the whole grammar fits one slide. So which, which means that, uh, yeah, it's more readable and it's more maintainable and uh, all the information is there about the precedence and uh, about associativity. And just to show you how good is this, so let's compare the one which is written in the natural form and the one which is uh, written, taken from the uh, specification. And let's see what is the difference. Yeah. So, so here I end our presentation and again, there are concepts that we found essential and build the foundation of our library. And uh, here you, the source code is available on the GitHub. So now we are preparing some instructions and uh, just putting things, packaging things. So, uh, well, it's advisable not to use it right now, but in the coming weeks uh, you can try it. And uh, this library is under development and there are some missing combinators that we still we plan to add, right? We just didn't yet have time. But yeah, and but you can already try to use it. Thank you. So, um, obvious question, how fast is it? Uh, uh, how does it compare with the other parser combinator libraries of, uh, of Scala and, and other, possibly? So, uh, I, actually, I mean, in Scala, we don't really have a combinator library that is general and creates SPPF and is not a parser combinator library. So, the thing is that if you compare it to other things in the generator world, I mean, there is a bit of overhead of Scala because of this map and flat map that we use, but that can get away with the staging. So there is one worst case uh, problem, which is cubic. So we have this horrible gamma grammar that you can see it perform, but that's not what we want. So what we want is that we want near linear performance on near deterministic grammar. It means that if you give it Java grammar because Java is most parts deterministic, we want it to run deterministically. And we also Linearly, yeah. So we also embed regular expressions, so I think we can put the figures later outside. So for example, for Java, for the horse source code of JDK, almost all files like can be parsed below one second. But that can also get lower. But you should note that there is always an overhead. It will never be as fast as 
deterministic ones, but I think it's acceptable if you want to run some sort of source code analysis or do some DSL. So it's not worse than other things that you see in parser generators in these language workbenches that use general parsers. But we expect things to get better. We plan to apply staging, staging this LMS library to try to get rid of a bit of this map, flat map overhead that Scala introduces. Bit-related question, perhaps. Have you tried it on sort of really large inputs and see how it performs in the running running time and also memory usage? Yeah. For example, for how much was that big Java file? I don't know. For for example, the, we've tried the JDK with regular expression. If you just regular expression embedded to the thing, I think the largest, the worst one that we get was like three seconds, but the majority below 500 milliseconds. Um, it was it, maybe 10,000 lines of Java code. But the problem is also this memory overhead because we always create this memory overhead under the scenes. So maybe mostly you hit the memory bound before the in very large input. But this is also something we have to work on. But this is sort of inherent to general parsing. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about the, um, essentially what you're doing is making the context-free grammar uh, a lot simpler mm -hmm. by making your parser uh, more powerful. I'm wondering, is it also possible to uh, compile your simpler uh, uh, context-free grammar to the uh, uh, grammar that a simpler parser can accept? Like when you had the, the, your own uh, Java grammar versus the actual real uh, Java grammar, could you compile your grammar to the Java grammar and use a regular parser instead? What's the difference uh, between those two? Do you understand my question? If I understood correctly, you mean if we get this natural one and sort of rewrite it, transform it into the yeah. specification one? You, re you rewrite the grammar instead yeah. of rewriting the parser. Yeah, but in, in behind the scene, I mean, there is no magic. It sort of simulates this rewriting because these parameters that we pass mm -hmm. essentially creates a new non-terminal that excludes things. But the whole point is that it's like the software development. You really don't care how the inner machinery works. You want to just give it something no, no, and it works. But here, I mean, under the hood, yeah, what's happening is essentially... It's essentially the same thing. The rewriting, right? Well, if the rewriting... Uh if you mean the rewriting uh, of, uh, precedence. of precedence, right? So, of course, it is not as efficient that, for example, in coding by the example that Ali showed, when you first eliminate the left recursion and then you encode the precedent there. But there you get a different kind of tree, and you really need to be aware of uh, what kind of rewriting is going on. And for the large grammars, it's almost impossible yeah. for non-experts anyhow see, so that there is a disadvantage there. But of course, our rewriting cannot be as fast as that rewriting. Yeah, and we need to try this LMS somehow to see how, to which extent we can get rid of this dynamicity that we introduce. But there is an opportunity there. There is an opportunity to try, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Terence Parr in Antler, he uh, introduced something called LL star grammars, with which in which a regular automata drives the backtracking process. Uh, so, how does expressiveness of LL star grammar compare to your approach? Okay. So, LL star is sort of an advanced form of uh, peg parsing, in a sense that in Antler three, what Terence does, he sort of creates a more advanced form of DFA for look at predictions. So usually you just look into the input, but what he does, he can predict much better. And at some point for some grammars, I mean, when they are recursive, it just, he kind of stops and he falls to backtracking, which tries the first alternative, second alternative, and it gives you a star. But he was also not happy with his approach, so he went now into Antler 4 called all a star, adaptive LL star, which essentially gives full backtracking to the parser, but he doesn't pack all parse forest back. He just picks the first one. I still don't fully understand how the internal machinery of Antler 4 works. So our parser, if you get the first parse and then stop parsing, it corresponds to 
all a star, this uh, adaptive LL star of uh, Antler 4. So Actually, we may also get the similar speed there, so if we just stop the parsing, then the many passes that still have to be tried, that's not going to be tried. But uh, yeah, so because he also has a complicated machinery and he needs to somehow keep the p track of the pass and then, right, so then give you three back. It must be very, something very similar to his PPF, maybe less overhead, but we still need to check how speed wise we mm. do in this setting, right? But one of the, one of the essential differences is that, for example, Antler 4 doesn't support indirect left recursion because they rely on rewriting left yeah. recursion and it uh, becomes very hard. Yeah, yeah. And for us, it's not a problem. And, and another thing is, is that Antler 4 also doesn't natively support left recursion, so he it rewrites the gram. No, it is a top-down parser, but left recursion really, really should go into a bottom-up mode unless you use this GLL, GSS approach or continuation passing style somehow to turn it into a loop dynamically. There is no way, but Antler rewrites the grammar, and I don't think that's a real option for parser combinator that you first rewrite your grammar and then put it back and then put it through. Right. Okay. And another difference is that uh, basically there is a lot of implicit semantics going on with Antler. For example, the precedence is by default is there, right? So it depends on the order of the alternatives. And I don't really see the way, for example, to define associativity groups. When you wanted to have alternatives that uh, have the same precedence, for example, right? But you disambiguate this part based on the different, for example, uh, applying the associativity group rule in here, right? So saying that these two rules of the same precedence, but they are left associative with respect to each other. And so that's another difference here. Yeah, sure. Do we use uh, lazy values uh, feature of Scala? Actually, uh, yeah. yeah. We do. We do. In many places, we do. Yeah, but not in the parser. The parser doesn't have a, the left recurs. This scene hides the lazy value, right? No, the termination is purely based on minimization. No, but, but of course, uh, to, uh, to allow. So in Scala, if, if you look at our recursive definitions, right, so they are value, recursive values, and uh, for this, we need to either to use call by name, right, as what we do, or we need to define the lazy, if there's a lazy val, otherwise the, the compiler will not be able to do it. So, but behind the scenes, in a couple of places, yeah. we do use lazy vals, but <coughs> not to terminate left recursion or anything else. Yeah. yeah, so I guess. That's it. Thank you very much for your... Thank you.